This is Yoram Miller. I hereby open the November 1st, 2021 meeting of the Village of Romerneck Board of Ethics. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to discuss some of our comments with the ad hoc committee that's evaluating uh, the code of ethics for the village at this point or some of their representatives. I, I know we're still missing a couple of people. Uh, so uh, at this point, I, I, I don't want to go into too much detail uh, until we sort of get the rest of our board uh, with us. Um, but while we wait, Dan, I do want to say, you know, it, it, it's interesting, I know, and I mentioned this to Alan, it's almost a year since we had the sort of first conversation uh, about things. And from our perspective, it was very nice to see the draft that came back over the summer that we're going to talk about now. You know, it really did address a lot of the things that we'd sort of picked up on and had concerns about. And more importantly, in some ways for us, you preserved a lot of the parts of the code that you know, we were a little nervous about what might happen to. So I really do want to thank you. It's, it's really an impressive uh, draft thank you. put together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I thought I served with a very uh, well-informed and, and dedicated committee. Uh, I, we met on a, I guess, a weekly basis for many months and went over the code section by section. And so um, we, and we tried to listen to as many points of view as possible including uh, the view of the, the ethics board and others who were stakeholders. So um, we hope uh, we hope it, 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 it would get a good reception. And uh, we also anticipated that there would be a lot of questions that arose and comments. We've gotten some of those too. We're meeting with the board of trustees next Monday. And um, so we'll hear their views as well. It um, took a, it, it, at some point, I guess it was in the late winter, early spring, we asked the board to extend us our term. And they extended us to December through December 31st. And we thought, oh, you know, that's that's pretty generous. But uh, um, it turned out not to be. <laughs> we we needed it. Still hoping I'm going to get some sort of comment from the rest. Now let me just quickly shoot an email over to those guys. While you're doing that, can I ask the um, Dan and Ellen, Please. have you had any feedback from us so in the last couple of months? Not at all. No. no. Okay. So um, the reason I asked is we've had a bunch of discussions about our, you know, what we wanted to give you feedback about. And I wasn't sure whether you had it uh, informally or by, by, you know, written in a written way. So the answer yeah. is no, you haven't heard from us yet at all. Correct. I, I wanted to do this as a, as, as a group, I, ideally, uh, and, and let everyone have a chance to participate in part because there were some provisions that we, had slightly different views on, and I thought it was important that the ad hoc committee heard all our views. So I thought this was the cleanest way to do that. Yeah, no, I'm not complaining. I just wanted to know, I want to pick up, I want to know where we were picking up at the beginning. Uh, speaking of beginning, while, while we wait for the other guys, let me give you some sort of high level comments that I know are not controversial uh, on, on our <laughs> side uh, that, that, that you know, hopefully will uh, make some sense. The one thing that we've discovered is there's so much turnover with the Board of Ethics over time that we really felt it was important that the someone within the village, ideally the clerk's office or the clerk treasurer's office, maintain the different files that are referenced, including the disclosure forms and uh, the advisory opinions, uh, We at least the redacted versions. And we, 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 we discussed this a little bit, and I don't have a ready answer yet, but I'll, I'll raise it. Uh, for example, like the advisory opinions, I know that, and we've been reluctant to disclose historically them publicly because it's very hard to redact them in a way that actually shields the identity of the person that made the request. Uh, at the same time, I think we do have to maintain those somewhere. And you know, I was hoping Alan might be with us because he's the one who had the sort of clever ideas on this. But if there was some system we could take that there's a secure file or folder somewhere that the village trustee technically maintains, uh, or maybe the village attorney, you know, we, we didn't get to that level of detail, uh, so that 
the opinions can be preserved in one place. Yeah. Uh, you know, just there's too much turnover to realistically expect the Board of Ethics to maintain those files. And so right. that, that was the one sort of big picture that I know all five of us all nodded our heads and instantly recognized was something that would be helpful. Yoram, can I yeah. jump in and ask a sure. question on that? So recently, in the last couple of months, the village was switching to make sure everyone had a village email address so we're not using <laughs> private emails. Would that help in any way in terms of being able to create a folder and some board of ethics email? Yeah, Alan actually, and, I, and I, it's a shame Alan's not here because I'm, I'm not going to butcher his idea. He had thought it might be possible just to have an email account where everything would be sent to. Yep. And so that, that one sort of village or board of ethics record or something like that would at least have a copy of everything stored that way. Uh, and, and so that, that's an idea that I know, you know Alan had fleshed out a little bit. And, and so that may be a way to deal with it. But uh, pretty much, I think, generally, and, you know, I, I, we went through the code and there are a number of places that it, you know, calls for the board of ethics to maintain documents. And I just think that, you know, that, that's just not going to happen realistically. And so it, we should have some sort of more secure way of preserving those files. Right. It, it, I think what Alan was saying was it does it it might be within the the village email system, but it could also be other independent cloud, you know, it just be called ethics board archive. Yep. And everything it could go up there. The yeah. only the, the only thing is these things are foilable, right? So there has to be one central person who is responsible for gathering whatever is being foiled. And it's not necessarily going to be a board of ethics member because it might be five years after, you know, the, the current board of ethics has served their term or whatever. Yeah. yeah, but I think all they have to do, it could be the, the chair of the board, sorry, uh, Yoram, but all they need to do is have a key. For, for the account and then that would get passed on. It would just be the, the passcode would get passed on. It wouldn't, you know, and then if there was a FOIL request, whoever was the chairperson of the board would be able to go into that those files. We yeah, I, ha I have to tell you, so the Arts Council does that. We have uh, Village of Maranac Arts Council gmail.com, right? So that we have a central uh, email address instead of using our all the private ones. And um, it, that, the password, Google says you need to change it and then it doesn't work and this one can't get in and it's linked to Instagram and Facebook and can't use it. I mean, there's so many things that go wrong with passing those things on that I think you, you can do that, but somebody in the village who's a staff person, I think also needs to be able to um, be in charge of that. Mm -hmm. Right, but Sherry, if it's on a village server, as opposed to gmail.com, yeah, I, that automatically puts it under village ownership. Right, with so their, that, I, with their built-in IT support. Right, so mm -hmm. whatever password you use to get onto that it needs to also live with um, someone like right. Sally. You know? Yep, yep. And the one wrinkle with that is uh, some of the materials won't shouldn't be visible even to Sally, uh, oh. and, and so we'd have to figure out, which is why I like the idea of having it in a designated place and then having someone from the board of ethics actually do the review if necessary. We don't have that many documents, <coughs> uh, so that that might be an easy solution. So Susan, that 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 may be the way to go. What you suggested. Well, I didn't make it up, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm speaking wait, for you, Alan. I have a question about though before you go on. So, um, when somebody puts in a FOIL request, is there a person before the documents um, get disseminated? Is there a person who says, "Well, that's not legal to give someone. That's not a FOILable document." I've had very little exp experience with the FOIL in the village. The couple times I've dealt with it, we've coordinated with the village attorney's office, and they've actually made all those calls. They ask us for the documents. We provide what we have, they collect whatever else they need to collect. And then from there, you know, we don't even see if they make a decision. What oh, so so the, the documents you collect go goes to the attorney first. Yeah, that, that's and how I've had it. They, oh, okay, gotcha. Alan, uh, welcome. We were actually just mentioning the suggestion you, you came up with of possibly having some way to 
store the board of ethics materials so that we're not expecting individual board members to do that just because of the turnover. So that was the first thing we went through. Yeah. Uh, and sort of the next item uh, we're going to have, and I, I, we can point to the specific provision, but I know it's the one that caused us sort of the most confusion uh, and, and, and some concerns would be the sort of two year period from when someone ceases to be a covered person to when they can have roles uh, in the village. Uh, it, it sort of raised a bigger issue, which is uh, for a board of trustee members, that, that type of two-year lockout makes perfect sense. Uh, there, there's some concern uh, that uh, for other positions, it may actually deter people that would be willing to volunteer on sort of discrete items or on things like one of the examples that was given was the Arts, Arts Council that really wouldn't have the same typical types of uh, conflicts concerns. And if there was some way to cabin that two-year period in a way that uh, we don't run the risk of deterring people that might be willing to do small projects or participate in ways that don't really have big policy making or control rights, uh, that they wouldn't be deterred from participating. I know, Sherry, you thought about that some as well. Uh, but that, yeah. that's sort of the one concern we had. And I don't think we have a ready answer for you, but that, that was just the one thing that uh, sort of did jump out at us. I don't know if you've gotten any other feedback on that. You, do you know offhand what section that is? Uh, I can look it up. It's section K number one. Uh, I can attach the, uh, if I have the ability to do that, as this is a participant, I can put the code, annotated code up here. Um, let's see. I can do that. I think I can. I, I don't need it. I have it on another screen here. Yeah, but I'll make it available for everybody. Well, just in case I'm the only one that has it. Oh, that worked. Ah. Magic. And what you have in the I think in that section, I'm reading it now, it talks specifically to employment. And I think if we clarify that we're talking employment versus being on a voluntary advisory type board, you know, like the Arts Council. No, uh, but it was, Sherry, weren't you talking about it would be the other way? If you're leaving a voluntary thing, could you do consultation? Well, so my, my example was, um, uh, if you are a member of the Arts Council and we, when we do our concerts and stuff, we deal with a lot of vendors. So let's say we deal with a vendor who does sound um, and I leave the Arts Council and um, I get a job with this sound vendor. I mean, I, I don't see anything why that's an ethical violation. Right, so we're saying you just disclose it to the Board of Trustees and hopefully it's approved or accepted by the Board of Trustees. The Trustees or the Board of Ethics? It says Board of Trustees. Wouldn't it make more sense to just give the Board of Ethics uh, just a blanket pass, a, a right to give people a blanket pass? Once something's been disclosed, then the conflict is sort of resolved. So in, in a case where Sherry wants to take a job or more common, we've got people, um, I think even trustee Natchez recently asked for an opinion, you know, what's his limit? Can he advise somebody to his professional capacity even though they're in the village? Um, if you disclose what you're doing to the board of ethics, doesn't that sort of keep everything above board and thus negate the uh, the conflict unless there is a there's a there is deemed to be a conflict in which case um if uh, how do you res how do you disclosure alone should not be enough there should be some yep actionable something some action that could be taken if the body to which the disclosure is made deems there to be a conflict. You mean like a gatekeeper. So you disclose to the gatekeeper and then they say, yes, you can go and do that work or not. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. And you guys designated the board of trustees as that gate, as that gatekeeper. 
Um, Probably should be at the ethics board, shouldn't it? The only benefit I, I see of the board of trustees is they meet a lot more frequently than we'll yes. be able to. <laughs> And if it's a situation with someone looking for employment, I hate to think that they'd be waiting on, you know, our, our meetings and our schedules. So uh, I think you're on to that point. I think we were also um, throughout the entire document. I think we were very conscious of the fact that the Board of Ethics is also a volunteer committee. Yeah. And what stuff can we shift away from you without causing harm? And we thought this was, you know, one of those places. However, you might be able to, or any of you might be able to um, give a clue as to how often this even happens. I, I have no idea. Uh, it's nothing that's ever come before us. Uh, so, uh, but I, I think Sherry's point is right that uh, a lot of places around the village sort of do business with the village, I'm going to give a really silly example because it's the only one I thought of, uh, but working at a restaurant like the Maranac Diner or Pizza Gourmet, you know, if, if you know, they, they, I assume, have pretty significant revenues from the village. Uh, I hate to think that someone was on the traffic commission and now we're having an issue whether they're, they can, you know, work, work at Pizza Gourmet. It just feels like uh, I, I completely understand the point of the two-year provision. And I, I think certainly for, you know, some positions, it makes perfect sense. Uh, but I, I just wonder if there's a way we could you know, create yeah. some tiering within it. I, I think we can, we can address that. Uh, first of all, before we go any further, I want to introduce Brian Kerr, who joined um, the meeting as a member of our, uh, member of the, um, the ad hoc committee, and also the committee's very hardworking secretary who did the minutes throughout the duration of the, the term of our work. Um, he lost a lot of weight and about six inches of height. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. All that stuff. Um, so I think there. What I think our goal was transparency and and sunshine. So what we may be able to do is just create a provision that. Um, uh, there be a um, an application to the ethics board, and one I'm just thinking at one one need not wait for uh, the approval, but before taking on employment. Uh, that makes me nervous because I don't want to have to come back and tell somebody to quit a job. So yeah, well, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I like the board of trust, or, or you can say before accepted by, e you know, either, because we have the general waiver provision that the Board of Ethics has that basically allows us to waive anything if we want to. Uh, so from that standpoint, if you want to formalize that either the Board of Trustees or the Board of Ethics can approve, I'm okay with that. I'm okay leaving it with the Board of Trustees. Uh, well, I, don't, I don't want to encourage form shopping. Yeah. Um, so then I'm okay leaving it where, where you have it. I think they can ask, act the quickest. Sorry, Susan. Yeah, I just, I'm not as okay with the Board of Trustees as I am with the, the Ethics Board, the, because the Board of Trustees is political. And I don't, you know, does it have to be a, a, a majority or what if, what, one, what if some person is, and we're, we're, we're nonpartisan and they're not. And I think that it's potentially could be a problem that somebody is going to get blackballed by somebody on the board of trustee and they won't be able to work. I don't know. I'm thinking under worst case scenario, but I'd rather have it be a, um, a you know, a, a, a neutral body making that decision. Who's you know we know about the ethics the ethics code. I don't I don't know. I mean, you're right. Expediently, you're right. It should be somebody who's meeting every week and they could just give them a rubber stamp and say, go get your job. I don't know how to I'm, figure that out. I don't know. I, I, I think that's where the tiering comes in. You know, to Yoram's example, if you're going to be a busboy at Pizza Gourmet, there's clearly no conflict of interest. Right. So yeah. we have to figure out how to get that tiering language in here. Yeah, I agree, because I don't understand. I, I mean, it, legally, how could you tell somebody that they can't take a job, you know? And I, I have a problem with that for most of the volunteer committees that are, are not, not political. 
you know, mo most of the volunteer committees are not, you know. I, I would say that if you're uh, serving on a committee and you have a job opportunity, um, there has to be some evaluation as to whether there is a conflict and you can apply uh, and perhaps get an expedited opinion. And if you don't get that opinion within a certain time, you have done your, fulfilled your obligation. Right, you, um, you've done your due diligence. I'm, I'm more concerned, I, I think the ethics board, which is more the so-called jury of one's peers, um, is the more appropriate place to go than a board of trustees. And with no disrespect to the board of trustees, getting an opinion out of the board of trustees is often a, a something of a time-consuming affair. Um, whereas I think at the ethics board can be convened, at least a form can be convened. Uh, and maybe you can, I'm just thinking out loud, free associating, you can even waive the, uh, for this purpose, not consider it to be one where a, the 72 hour notice is required. Um, but I, 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 hear, I hear you loud and clear on this and um, we, we can address this perhaps in a way that enables the, the person involved to get that clearance quickly. And where if there is a delay in response, they can just proceed with no, uh, no, no prejudice, no disadvantage to them. So um, Dan, going the other way in terms of talking the time frame, when I was um, still working for an investment bank, we did a lot of bond trading. Um, in order to get on the budget committee, I needed to get approval from the compliance department about conflict of interest. And the guidelines there were, if you did not get a response within 48 hours, go ahead and- Interesting. And do what you want. Well, it was a British company also, so, but- <laughs> um, it wasn't a do what you want, but if you truly believe there's no conflict, you can go ahead and we'll continue looking into this. And I knew there was no conflict because we didn't trade municipal bonds. So, you know, there wasn't an, in, an issue there, but they did have a time frame in terms of response, but it could be yanked. So if I made the bad decision and compliance came back with an issue, I would have had to quit. Okay. If I could add one, Yoram, there, there are some real world examples where this is applied our time at, on the Board of Ethics. Um, for example, Trustee Natchez does a lot of work in the village privately for people, but since he became a trustee, he doesn't, right? So if I wanted to hire him to survey my property and, re, you know, rethink the... Um, the zoning of it for me, uh, he won't take that job this year, right? So for two years after that, that sort of makes sense that, you know, there's a reason that a, um, a trustee shouldn't be hired by a, even a volunteer. Um, so having a clear ethics uh, opportunity for the ethics board to look at something or, or possibly kick it up to trustees if they're, they can't decide in time. Uh, whereas other examples we've already seen where one trustee, their daughter worked, is volunteering at Mamaronet Fire EMS. And the question was, can she preside over the, um, the voting of their budget? Is that a conflict? Well, it would be a conflict if it was, you know, if there was more financial at stake for her. So here's, it's not her having the position, but it was her close family member. Uh, so again, the village, I mean, the ethics can look at it and put their gut opinion on it. And then if it doesn't work, it makes sense. That the trustees could have a second look. Would, does that? You mean if we don't approve it, they can almost appeal to the board of trustees? Not approve, but maybe if we're not able to resolve it. Um, if, if, if we're not, if the ethics board isn't comfortable resolving or aren't the right people. If it involves me trying to hire Dan Natchez, obviously that would be, it would cover both, but that, you know, ethics could, could figure that out. Um, I, I think there was, a, I, one question was, historically Natchez had done work for 
um, well, I forget the name of the party that was involved, uh, Goldstein. Uh, and he had done some survey for work for her before he became uh, a trustee uh, or advising work. Uh, it may have even been unpaid. Um, as long as it's sort of been, had he been condoned by the board and disclosed that, then that would have resolved the conflict that they had later. So once it's once everything's in the sunlight, then it's no longer a conflict, right? So ethics could look at it and say, oh yeah, okay, thanks for letting us know that you had done the work. It's no longer an issue uh, or you intend to do the work. Um, so does it make sense, I guess, is to have a tier where ethics can decide and if ethics can't, then ask the trustees to decide. Because also we want to take it off their plate. They have a lot to do in their meetings and they don't want to look at every policeman's side job. Hey, I'm gonna hire, I've been hired to do security for a party this weekend. Can I do that in the village? Is it a conflict? Uh, my gut reaction to that is that I believe we should have full confidence in the ethics board. Yeah. And when you pass it on to the board of trustees, you're now going to start engaging potentially lobbyists, favors. Right. Yeah, that's um, what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. ethics it becomes much more political. Yeah. Oh, hey, Jeff. Uh, hey, I've been listening. Oh, good. Uh, Dan, I, I like the suggestion of waiving the 72 hour rule. Uh, we're not going to live in COVID era forever. So if there's a way we could also waive the in person meeting requirement and allow that decision yeah. to be made over the phone, uh, I think that would be a 48 hour decision. Okay. Well, and I think with emails, you have that audit trail yeah. and especially if we're storing all documents in a central place you know it's accessible um all right well i think you've given us a good um a, a very good suggestion and i think it's something that we can um we can address and uh revise we're talking about k1 here i believe yeah uh, section um, K1. So um, we'll um, I'll, we'll we'll take a look at that and uh, uh, and come back to you with a suggested uh, rewording of it. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks. Uh, we now have everybody. Uh, so Dan, if you'll uh, and if you guys will just indulge us for a couple minutes, Jeff. We only have until December sixth to sort of finish our annual business, which includes preparing an annual report. Uh, so I'd like to get two more meetings for us on the calendar, uh, one ideally some, sometime next week and maybe the week after that, uh, so we can sort of wrap everything up. Can we just check our schedules and see if there's a time? Yeah, uh, hold on. Let me get my time. Yeah. Uh, Yoram? Yep, Susan. Um, are there a couple of other things that we want to discuss with the um, with committee? Absolutely. I just know that we're going to lose some of our board along the way. So I just want to. Okay. I, I just wanted, because there's some. We have a few on our, a couple more items on our. List. Okay, good. Because I wasn't sure whether I missed a meeting or something. <laughs> so no, 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 nothing at all. Yeah. So when do we have to schedule this thing? Can Does it have to be nine to five for the village to. Um, Generally, have? yes, because we, we don't have a liaison. So Sally is the one who actually organizes our calls for us. Okay. So what, what day are you thinking of, uh, your I just, whatever works for people, I just would love to do it the next two weeks, you know, one, one meeting each of the next two weeks. Okay, I'm pretty clear. It's nine to five, I'm good anytime, but school hours are better for me. Oh, okay. What if we did Wednesday the 10th at 10 a.m.? Does that work for everyone? Yeah. So, no, no, mm -mm. I'm, I'm working all morning on Wednesday. We do 2 p.m. Wednesday the 10th? I That's could, better for me. Does that work for you, Alan, or did it get too late? Yeah, it got too late. Can we do 1 p.m.? Would that work for you, Alan? Yep. Can we do 1, 1 p.m. on the 10th? Um, I need a little bit more time. Can you do 1.15? Uh, 1.15 it is. Thanks, everybody. And do we just want to do uh, the exact same time one week later on the 17th? Wait a minute. Okay. 
Jerry, does that work for you? That's good. Works for me. All right, excellent, guys. Thanks for indulging us with that. Uh, Dan, I guess before the next thing I was thinking we'd do is just sort of page turn and I can tell you where we had some thoughts. Uh, do you guys have any questions for us? Like I said, I, I'd like to have give you the benefit of the full board uh, if you guys have any questions for us at this point. From the from the committee? committee towards the for us, yeah. Uh, I I don't. Uh, Ellen or Brian, if you have any questions. No, I don't. I think Dan, throughout our whole review, you've been reaching out to the board of ethics when we had questions. So I think we covered everything. I don't have any questions. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, that, that, that's perfect. And I just thought probably the easiest way is to turn pages. If anybody else on the ethics committee has a comment about something that I don't get to, please just you know, let us know in order and, and, and we'll address it. That, I think that's the easiest way. So if we can go to page two, the definition of covered person. <laughs> Uh, I was a little uncomfortable with the word consultants uh, and sort of wasn't sure what that meant or how far it went. And if, if somebody had a sort of one time they were brought in on a discrete project, uh, to, to what extent are they covered by the code? So I don't pretend to have any answers, but I just know that that was a term that I could see down the line getting confusing for us. I think what we were basically trying to get to, if, well, when we first started the review, it was very inconsistent throughout the code as to who this applied to, who it didn't. And we were just trying to say, unless it's called out otherwise, the code applies to everyone on who's an employee, a paid employee, or on any volunteer committee, commission, et cetera, et cetera. If you're a consultant, you're quasi paid employee. Um, so we thought it would apply. And we went so far as to say, you know, if you're a major vendor, contractor working on a village construction project for months, this should apply to you as well. We had some, we had real concerns that the, the village does hire consultants and if they are not part or bound by a code of ethics, then th that is, is quite a big loophole. We had a, a, um, a, a running theme throughout the term of our meeting, uh, which um, Ellen always referred to as the who. <laughs> when trying to figure out whether sections were intended to cover certain pe people so much so that I promised that when all our work was done, I was going to get her a poster of the who um, <laughs> and that, to commemorate her, her being uh, so persistent, thankfully, in pointing this out. So that is why the covered person category is so broad and um, it's um, it's ruled by exception. So if, if you, were, you can specifically accept it, but we wanted very, very much to have the broadest possible coverage for the code. And I think the reality is whenever we were discussing the WHO, we had a hard time identifying when or who wouldn't be covered by this or explaining why somebody wouldn't be covered by it. I have, I have a follow-up with that. If it's obvious that the board members would and trustees and all that, what about those ancillary, you know, the people who are in that gray who category would anybody tell them that they need to be aware of the ethical um, principles that they have to follow? How would they know? Well, as part of the um, annual process, everyone who's covered by the code of ethics gets this online. Oh, that's part of the disclosure. 
and has to attest that they read it and so on. I so think it's done through Power GMS. But so so um, the consultants, those people on the, not just the people on the board, the consultants. They would get, get it. it. Would they under, get it? Under the new code, they must get a copy of the code of ethics of in response to an RFP that has been submitted. And okay. they must attest to their knowledge and compliance with the code of ethics if they are awarded a contract. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to know because you know the edges of this may not the people may not be aware of that they're uh, responsible. But I think that so then you have that goes back to section K. If you have a consultant who is a freelancer uh, working for the village of Mamaroneck and the village of Mount Kisco and and whatever this two year you can't take another job because whatever kind of. If I were a consultant, I wouldn't, you know, that's why I think it needs to be tiered. I understand. I also think that once you get into, when you, if there's a huge difference between being on the Arts Council on the one hand and making money from the village on the other. Uh, so if you are a paid consultant, uh, there is an economic consideration and the, the two year bar becomes more significant but to your point, and as we discussed, there is the opportunity to apply for a waiver. Okay, yeah. thanks. Well, I mean, I, so I'm a freelancer. And if I knew that if I took a freelance job, a consultant job with the village meant that for two years, I had to go through this bureaucracy to consult for anybody else <laughs> having who lives in the village or has anything to do with the village, I probably wouldn't take that job because it's, you know, freelancers have to take jobs wherever they can take jobs. And I think putting uh, all that bureaucracy, having to ask permission for two years from the village to take these other jobs, I think is. Well, is it that much of a bureaucracy if you are getting paid to do work for the village? Uh, you are making an application to the Board of Ethics. And that's where, and if there was truly a conflict, uh, then you shouldn't be doing the consulting work or you shouldn't be working in that capacity. But if it's, there's no conflict, then you're going to get the okay. But there should be some kind of a filter or an opportunity for the village to decide whether there is a conflict or not. I agree with you. If it's if you are stuck, your your paperwork is stuck in a long process, and you're not getting a, a, a response. But I think what we're talking about here is is getting that kind of response so that both sides are happy. Can Can I just ask, like, can you give me example of um, of that where it is a conflict of interest? Like, I'm I'm not I'm obviously not thinking about the same jobs as you are. So can you just give me an example of where it would be a conflict? If you if you are a um, if you're on the zoning board, yeah, and you are also doing some kind of well, let's say you're on you're you're in the uh, landscaping business and you're on a committee that will consider whether wheat flowers are going to be outlawed in the village of Mamaroneck. Um, if you're a consultant to, if you're doing consulting work for the village uh, where you're trimming hedges down the median on Orient Avenue, uh, I think there's a potential conflict that, well, I need leaf flowers. They're part of my, the work I do. And so there's an inherent conflict there. So I don't know that you should be on the, the committee that has to or is going to be deliberating or considering whether leaf blowers should be banned or not if you're also doing consulting work that involves uh, landscaping. That's different. That's like if you're on that committee, you would recuse yourself from that because it's conflict of interest between you and your job, right? But I'm talking about uh, maybe I'm not understanding the section correctly. What I understood was if you were on 
one of the boards or had a job in the village, whatever, and you then were no longer part of that committee or whatever, there, were, there was a two year gap where you couldn't take a job with an entity that um, has something to do with the village. Am I not understanding that correctly? Um, I think I'm, I'm kind of not understanding you, but maybe uh, you or Brian, yeah. if I'm missing can something. I, can I jump in for this a little bit? I think that the purpose is so that you don't make a, like a deal with, you don't make a deal with somebody while you're in a position of power so that after you're done, they can pay you back by giving you a job or, or a, a contract. It's the idea that after I'm done with this, you're gonna owe me. And so those two years would give you a chance for the owing to go away. This, isn't that why you do it like that? It is uh, so that um, you cannot, yes, you cannot take advantage in part, you cannot take advantage of a position that you had or specific knowledge that you had about the way the village works to then position yourself to take advantage of that. Right. Ex exploit that, that knowledge and right. that opportunity. It's basically saying that whatever was constraining you before should continue to constrain you. It doesn't just go away the minute your term is up because it's covered be while you're still on the board. It's just not covered afterwards. And you're adding the after, you're adding the tail, so to speak. Right. Okay, I just, I, I think that's the reason because, you know, it's, I, I keep thinking of it in terms of, do they owe you? Or can, you know, am I in a position of power over somebody and now I can get something from them? It's payback, two years, two, you can't get payback for two years, basically. I don't know, it's the way I see it. No, that's how I see it as well. I and mean, back to Sherry's point, and that, that, that's why if there was some materiality threshold, some linkage, some way that we could just not have it, every single covered person has the outright two-year prohibition subject to getting approval uh, for any dealings with any entity that deals with the villages. There was some way that we could create a link between whatever the person's role as a covered person was and uh, the, the two-year waiting period. I, I think that would make it easier. Uh, well, I, I think that's where the discretion of the ethics board comes in. If you're on the zoning board of appeals, you leave the zoning board of appeals and you say, hey, look, I'd like to come back and make and represent my neighbor uh, who just wants to put a fence around their backyard, but the, there's a covenant against it. The board says, yeah, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's just you're helping out a neighbor. But if um, uh, someone leaves the zoning board of appeals and says, puts themselves out as a, an expert on the Marinick zoning board of appeals matters, hire me. I know everybody on the board. Um, that's right. different. No, that, 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 that's perfect. That, that's why that, that, that's the linkage or sort of, sort of the materiality component that would, you know, I, I, I think, think I'm hearing that that would make some of us feel better. So I, I think, Cherry, you you're, you raise a very good point, but I think the, uh, based on the discussion we have, I, I don't think you're going to be, at, I think the key point in what you raised is, am I going to be stuck in a bureaucracy? And hopefully you won't be. Uh, and you won't be discouraged or deterred from making a otherwise benign application for an exemption. If you guys don't mind, I'm, I myself am starting to run out of time. So if we could jump, the, the next item I had, a, this is a legitimate question. Uh, the definition of confidential information. Yes. On the bottom of page two. I understand one makes perfect sense. The you, you're not allowed to disclose it. Uh, two, uh, the notion of being exempt from FOIL. Uh, it feels to me that just the fact that information is FOILable doesn't mean that absent a FOIL request, people should be free to talk about it and and, and share it. And it. And it just felt like confidential information should include some other categories of information that uh, just, and, and, I, and I like what you did later, which basically says, don't take advantage of information you learn 
while on the job and use it for another purpose. I, I, I just, I wasn't sure if this captured enough uh, and if it was broad enough the way it's defined here. You know, I, I, believe I, I believe I lifted that right from uh, the New York City Municipal Code. Um, I may have referenced that somewhere, but can you, what, if you could describe again what you feel, do you, is, is it too restrictive? Is it too liberal? I, I was worried the definition wasn't as broad as we actually might want it. Uh, I think it should be more broad. Yeah, I, I was wondering if it covered everything that we sort of view as confidential information. Well, perhaps if you could look, come up with an example of something that you think that might fall through the cracks. Yeah. Let, let me, let, I don't want to sort of slow things down. So let, let me get back to you. Uh, so. Yeah, I'll come back. If, if you can come back with an example, as I said, I looked at that directly from a statute. I, I think I lifted it directly from the statute. So um, if you can come back, we can, uh, we can, I can take another look at that and see if there's, there's a loophole there that needs to be closed. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. I don't want to slow things down. Uh, I have some little, almost like typo type comments. I don't want to waste everyone's time with those. If that's okay, Dan, I can just email you those separately. Yeah, I have no doubt that those are there. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, page six, uh, it, it's D3. Uh, I noticed you didn't mention covered person. It was just no person. And I, I felt like we probably meant to have covered there. Otherwise it would prevent like the Girl Scouts from setting up a table out on village property and things like that, which I don't think was the intention. Oh, very much so. Yeah, we were, uh, <laughs> I see them at the train station once a year and I figured I got to take care of that. Um, um, <laughs> okay, let, let, let me take a look at that and see if, um, uh, why it was, um, I think it was just an omission. Okay. Part four says covered person, so. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's under the typo category. Okay, I'll take a little look at that. Because D1 also starts with no covered person. Yeah, this goes back, my next comment goes back to my question about the definition of confidential information. On page seven, E1, at some points you used confidential information and at others, non-public. And I was just curious why the distinction. I'm sorry, where are you? Uh, E1, so one page up. I'm sorry, it is page seven, you're, you're right. And it's my, re my glasses need to be changed, it's F1, I'm sorry. Okay. What's the problem with that? Oh, you know what? It's okay. Uh, I, I take it back. Uh, the only question I had about F1 is, should we have some phrase in there that deals with it requiring that the information be obtained in the course of their official duties? Uh, I could see a scenario that someone actually submitted the confidential information themselves to the village, but that shouldn't preclude them from using their own information. So again, your question on this is? Could we add some phrase just making clear that uh, the information that the person can't use is something that they acquired in the course of their official duties? That's there. Uh, the covered person. It's no covered there. Person. It says acquired. Oh, you're, you're right. You're right. I, I take it back. I apologize. Can, Yoram, what about yeah. the, the question that I had about um, the conflicts with the um, uh, the, the people who are uh, 
If you're having an affair with somebody, it's not covered at all in this? Why don't you, uh, I think that's perfect for the ad hoc committee. We, uh, we, we've struggled with whether there should be some issues that relate to sexual harassment and, and those types of relationships. No, that, that's not actually what I was saying. Sorry, sorry, go on, Susan, yeah. That I was saying that somebody, it may not be, I'm trying to find the place where it says all of the people who are, um, so you can't hear relative, spouse, domestic partner, parent, step parent, sibling, but what if you're having an affair with somebody that's not covered there? And I would think that it's not, not necessarily if there's sexual harassment or not, but you know, somebody might not want everybody to, you know, there should be some prescription against uh, voting on something or having power over somebody that it's not in that category, but you have an intimate relationship with. Right, but how do you draw the line on that? So it may not be having an affair with someone, but it's, you know, one of your dear friends. No, you're right. Um, you're, you're right. I mean, Yoram kept, Yoram kept saying that this was about whether it's sexual harassment or, you know, are people allowed to have relationships with the people that they work with, for example. That's not harassment, but potentially, you know, could be. I, I don't that know. Be more of, one of the things we were grappling, I'm sorry, I just cut you off. Um, no, that's okay, go ahead, Ellen. One of the things we were grappling with on and off is what becomes an HR policy versus a code of ethics policy. Right. And one of the members of our committee was in HR and unfortunately she didn't join us today but quite often she was very explicit. That's an HR policy, um, not code of ethics. But does the HR policy pertain to village um, volunteer uh, committees? I, I don't know what our HR policies are to be honest from a village perspective, but we didn't think it belonged in the code of ethics is the point that I'm making. I don't know, I can, you know. Yeah, you could argue. Yeah, I, I could see that. But if you're going to put aunt and nephew and niece in the relative compartment department and the only person that you might be having an intimate relationship with that would be covered in this is a spouse or a domestic partner, there's a huge there's a huge position in between there that I think could potentially put somebody in a, in a conflictual role. Yep. But I, I don't I don't know. I, I just it felt strange that it was um, friends are okay. You can do stuff for friends if they're not married to you and they're not, you know, related to you. I think it's pretty hard to define at what point one crosses the line or how one defines a friendship of consanguinity. Right. <laughs> intimate relationships in order to get to the level where you can actually write it out and say if you are having a, a, you can't define intimate um you could have a wonderful platonic relationship and engage in a conflict of interest i think it's a matter of uh i, I think we talk about personal interest here somewhere which might cover that but uh i would echo what ellen said about um the um, it, it being more of, of an HR issue because HR codes in the year 2021 do address these kinds of things. Right. Um, well, well I, I think what's happened is that when we discuss versions of this, you, you end up with give the reasonable appearance of a conflict of interest or impropriety. That's under the rec recusal thing. But I think that you know, at a certain point that would, that, that actually may cover this because if we're, we don't want to have to ask people the details of their relationships with people, clearly. I mean, it's totally ridiculous, but I, I don't, I think that there are relationships he, that people could have that should be covered that aren't. And unless you allow somebody, um, an opportunity to, to address that, 
I guess it's impropriety, but that's going to get you nowhere. That would be a terrible thing if everybody says, I think it's improper to do this. And, you know, they're in trouble because somebody thinks it's improper. That could be anything. Smoking a cigarette on the street used to be improper, you know? Uh, I think you have to have some other covering language because the statute has to be read specifically. And if you, somebody could say that has that kind of relationship could say, well, I'm not named in that paragraph. Therefore I can do what I want. Yeah. Um, you could say something, just a catch all that says, or other similar relationships oh. um, and leave it to the board of ethics to decide. That's good. I, I think you're going to, I think that's going to be runs the risk of being void for vagueness. Once you talk about similar, <laughs> as, as a lawyer, I can tell you that that's, that just won't fly. Yeah, well, except that then, then this, that section of the statutes read specifically as statutes are, and therefore, if you're not included in there, then you're not covered. Right. Yeah, I, I my, my reaction then is to see if there is another code of ethics or municipal statute that addresses that and see, and if it does, see if we can adapt that to the code. If there's not, then my assumption is that those governments have left it to their HR policies or have chosen not to try to take it on in terms of definition. So uh, if it's okay with you, I, I don't wanna cut off discussion, but let me see if I can find something in a code that addresses that very thing. Can, can I, I like what you said. I just wanted, you know, I was the one that sort of brought this concern up. I think I've been watching too much TV, you know, what can I say? <laughs> um, that morning, morning news thing, morning show. But, you know, at the end of the day, I really wouldn't want people looking into everybody's private lives. I think that there's a really big danger here of doing this the wrong way. Um, and I almost would rather have it be, oh, we find out later that there was a relationship between two people and it wasn't covered and, you know, too bad than everybody is being, you know, policed by, you know, the ethics committee. I, I don't know, I, I, it's a big thing, it's a big loophole, but uh, we have to be really careful about not going too far with it. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. That this be one of the items we raise with the village attorney? Who's clearly gonna be reviewing what we wrote, but um, let's get his input. Hey, I, that's a good idea, Ellen. I like Ellen's suggestion, but I also like that, Dan, you gone to the New York City Municipal Code and just researching what other cities have done, that's a good place to start. Yeah, that, I, I, can, I can take that on. Um, you could do both. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And this wasn't addressed. We looked at the Code of Ethics for some of our surrounding communities and this was not addressed. Right. Yeah, I think you're going to find... They're just not as good as us. Well, I, I think not. we'll find that if our if our revised code is adopted, we're going to be have one of the strictest codes in uh, in New York. Good, but I also think we're going to have one that's much more um, understandable. Mm -hmm. so, we got rid of a lot of the vagueness. Uh, can I record that for the future? <laughs> it is being recorded. recorded. I've been in this village for since the middle 70s and I saw I can think of offhand probably half a dozen examples of things that happened that would be, would have been prohibited by this code we needed it we need it yep all right for the interest of time um do we your there were a couple more on your list I think but we we'll, we'll resolve this one for the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Let me jump ahead. I'm going to have a few comments uh, that just relate to some of the timing. I appreciate speeding up some of the timing provisions. For example, 
uh, on page 10 in uh, section A. Uh, I'll let the Board of Trustees tell you if 72 hours is enough time for them. Uh, but that, that, that whatever they send that, you know, from our perspective, I'd want that to go to the clerk treasurer as well as just the Board of Ethics. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll leave it to others who know the process better than I do, whether uh, the January 15th is enough time. Uh, but We did consult with the, uh, I think with Sally and with, um, uh, Oggy, uh, on this, and I, I, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Brian or Ellen, but I think they were comfortable with it. Yes, they were. Yeah, they were. Next, and I... again, if um, if the system power DMS is used, and I don't know that a hundred percent of those covered have access to that, that does reside in village records, not necessarily with Board of Ethics. Uh, the one question I had was about the fines on uh, F for non-compliance uh, with the annual disclosures. <laughs> uh, one very practical thing, which is uh, the, I, I think 500 is just too high uh, for sort of an out of the box error. And I know that we can be waived by the Board of Ethics, but I, I just, I fear that's one of those things that may deter people from, or create the sense that people don't want to get involved with uh, the village. So uh, that, that's the one thing. And uh, I don't remember which section it comes up and I just have a note that uh, when there's anything to do with a failure to cure uh, or anything like that, I, I think it should be uh, oh, I, I know sort of where it was. It's the notion that uh, for each additional 30-day period, the, you know, there's a further fine. Yeah. Uh, I think we should have a notice that has to go out to people that you fail to produce it, please produce it. And any further fine should be tied to that other notice. Uh, someone may have honestly not known and just be racking up those fines. Yeah. Uh, so that, 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 that's one concern there. Sorry, you're on Two quick questions. Could it be a fine up to $500 and or should it, instead of a fine, because that's one way to do it, should it just be that at some point they, they're suspended from their duties until it's fixed? That suspension's already in there and I think that's a wonderful okay. addition that they've made. Love it. Yeah, I'll tell you that we were not of one mind on the fine situation. We had a number of discussions. So I, I wouldn't look upon it as etched in stone. Uh, I, this is one of the many issues that I think we're going to just send over to the Board of Trustees and your view may well be uh, replicated in one or more trustees who may scale this back. But we thought that there should be some adjustment for inflation uh, given the when the last code was enacted. But it's, it's not, uh, there was a fair amount of discussion among ourselves about it. And then there's another number, and I apologize for not having the section right in front of me, but it's the extent to which the Board of Trust, uh, the board of Ethics can find people for violating the code. Uh, right now we're capped at 1500. Uh, and we actually, in the one big public hearing that we've had, uh, there was discussion within the board whether, uh, it, it subsequently sparked discussion whether that 1500 number was the right number. Uh, and, uh, yeah, there it is. Yep. Uh, I'm wondering if that's one that inflation might make sense uh, to, to increase and actually allow the Board of Ethics to give a number that actually might, in, in light of the circumstances, might make sense based on what the violations are. Um, there too. Um, I think we're at the fine process. We were, we had a lot of discussions about it. And so I think there too, it's ultimately going I think it will be the board of trustees will decide. And there's input can come in from anyone, of course, as to whether it's fair or not fair. So I'm, we can raise it again. 
uh, and say that there has been some view expressed by a member of the ethics board. I don't know if among ourselves we're going to agree to change it because we had a diversity of opinion among ourselves. So but can we go back to the initial um, section where we had the 500 fine? Um, uh, and it's a question of fine related. Who do you think should be doing the chasing? So if some someone has not submitted the disclosure, is that some does following up sit with the board of ethics or the clerk treasurer? As a practical matter, the clerk treasurer has been doing that. So if you want to make okay. it reside with the board of ethics, but authorize us to delegate it or to instruct the clerk treasurer to make the announcements, that, that, that I'm comfortable with that. Okay. So can't all the fines be graduated according to either time, if it's about um, not, not doing the disclosure or um, severity in terms of the um, violations? I mean, why should it be one number? Well, it's Can't, up to, doesn't it? Not on the disclosure one. Oh, 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 oh. It can be, um, it can be amended to uh, scale it. Yeah, I think that would be good. All right, that's that's a good suggestion, but we'll we'll take it up at a at our at our next meeting. And then the other provision I had, and this is just an asking for more time for the Board of Ethics to act uh, request on page twelve. Uh, subsection I. Uh, first of all, I don't think we should have the clerk treasurer making the determinations about the adequacy of the disclosure statement. So if we could remove that reference to the clerk treasurer, I think that would be good. I think all we meant there um, was were all questions answered, not was the content answered appropriately. Right. Because yeah, that when it said misstates, I, I I thought that was actually more of a asking to get into the evaluating the adequacy of the disclosure. So how about if we just remove the word misstated? Sure. Okay. But I do think there has to be a place which this seems like the right one that the ethics board does have to notify someone if it appears that their disclosure is inadequate. Says so that. Doesn't it say the ethics board shall inform the covered person who filed it? Yeah, the sentence. Board. It also mm -hmm. says shall determine whether the disclosure statement is sufficient. Yeah. That's the ethics board. Yep. And then uh, I, I thought the 10 day period seemed a bit tight. Uh, and if maybe we can expand that. So are you saying that, are, are you okay with the clerk treasurer telling the filer that the filer has omitted information but not misstated information and the ethics board may determine either? That, 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 that's fine. And, and uh, the, the village clerk then can see if there's a blank, but it gets complicated, at least on the current form, not every, person has to fill out the form has to fill out every section. And so I'm wondering if making one person sort of have to deal with those questions of is the form filled out and have all the appropriate blanks been completed. I still think that might be a, a better thing to leave with just the ethics board as opposed to put that on the village. And treasure. does the ethics board have the bandwidth to, to do so? I, I think we do, although it may be something that takes up to 30 days, which is why uh, I, I do think it just, and, and I haven't focused on how this provision works uh, that closely, but uh, the person shouldn't in any way be punished or and nothing should be held against them for 
the failure of the ethics board to get back to them quickly enough. All right, let's, um, if you're saying that you're okay with the, the, the intent of the section, but for purposes of, of fairly administering this, the ethics board needs more time, then I think that's, that's reasonable. I think so, yeah. Ellen, Brian, do you have a, are you okay with that? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Okay. All right, that's that's a good point. Yeah, it was the within day, 10 days the ethics board shall inform, but that was my only concern. That that was... So are, are you saying expand to 30? I think that would, 30 we could make work, yeah. Okay, okay. And I think those were the principal sort of comments. The, the rest I had were gonna be really sort of the non-controversial variety that I don't wanna take anyone's time with. And in the next couple of days, Dan, I can email those to you. And if yeah. anything don't make sense, just let me know. And part of that will just be a list of places where I thought it would be helpful to, uh, previously thought it would be helpful to make the clerk treasurer responsible for, the, for the, some of the materials as opposed to the ethics board. And I can just make that list and you guys can determine whether you think there's a reason why it should be the ethics board that maintains those files as opposed to the clerk treasurer, things like the disclosure statements. I think it's probably more in terms of, of having a central repository, but sit, do send it, uh, send any of the, anything that you see as a typo, send it. Um, when I, uh, when I retired, I lost my secretary, my assistant of 10, 12 years. And uh, when my sons moved out, I lost in-house tech support. <laughs> so, so, uh, I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, I have, can I just go back? Excuse me, but I, yes. I'm confused about something and maybe I wasn't listening carefully. But when we were talking about the 10 day versus the 30 day, we need 30 days, but why should they get 30 days to tell us whether they object? I mean, it's, it, are you saying 30 days, all of those 10 days are gonna be turned to 30 days in the I uh, on page 12? Or it would just be that we get more time, but if all the covered person may file uh, an objection stating the reasons for the objection, isn't 10 days enough for the, the individual? I don't know. What we're, we're, a lot of the people we're dealing with or that are going to deal with these forms are not familiar with the forms. They're okay. so unusual to them. I'd like them to have enough time to consult with whoever they want to and, you know, ask some questions and think about it. I'm just not sure, considering how unusual this is, that 10 days, the effect of not getting back to us in 10 days seems to be it's too late for them to question our decision. And I just Something like that I'd like people to okay. have. So you want everybody to have 30 days on this whole thing because it's just such a slow process. I don't know if 30 days is the right amount, but I, I do think more than 10, whether okay. it's 20, I, I, think, yeah, okay. I, don't know, I want but... to make sure that you were talking. I know we need more, but I don't know whether the individual would need more. That's what I was asking. Right. Since you were on page 12 there, uh, where you dissolve and then reconvene the board, which oh, right. makes some sense. It would we would lose the um, stag the staggered uh, appoint appointments, which would create a problem down the road. So because we all you know everyone's each term is expires on a different year. And we Alan, don't want to start I, everyone at the same time. If you don't mind, let me jump in and ask a question because that, that may sort of cut through this. That's the old language from when the code was first enacted. Yep. Yep. We first saw it, and sort of our collective reaction was. Oh no, they want to dissolve this board and start over from scratch. As I read your comment and looked at it again, is this just a holdover from the original code and you're not suggesting? Exactly. And and the trend, and we told we're telling the board of trustees to everything. It, yes. We did we chose not to take on the mechanics of removing sections that would not necessarily be applicable. We're leaving this to the village council, and we've also are advising the board of trustees to hire a law writer, someone who for a living writes laws for the legislature so that they can unify the gender terms and address the 
language and usage issues um, so that you, you don't have some of these, these grammatical problems. So long answer to your question, yes, ignore it. Right. My, I guess my, my only concern was that the way the original code, if I remember, was that it stagnates the terms. Staggers. So, Staggers terms. So I'm sorry. I haven't had my coffee today. So <laughs> as long as that was in there, then, you know, you're being reappointed, but the first seat served for this long and the second for the next, then that sort of solves my issue. We, yeah, I, I envision, we envision that nothing, the, the current board is not going to be dissolved. And it will affect terms. It's, um, as I said, it was just a, a holdover that we didn't want to mess around with. Okay. And we would just tell the board of trustees, you got to do something with this. And whatever you do, check with counsel and hire somebody who writes laws for a living. Okay. Uh, and then my one other comment, which is back to where you started today, um, regarding the continuity of the information that's stored. Um, it's nice for us to say, oh, the village is gonna store it on a Google server and then we'll hand that password to whoever the next ethics leader is or whomever. But that's not a very time proof way to do it because technology keeps changing and it'll probably change again before the law changes mm -hmm. uh, or before we rewrite the code again. So would it make sense to say that it's the village's responsibility to store it securely and leave that as a very vague blanket so that right now it may be just, let's do everything in Gmail, but next year the village, which frankly they should have done five years ago is has a central depository of, of information. Uh, but as that change, you know, as however that changes over time and I can't guess where we'll be in 10 years, but if the code should be written vaguely enough to say that it needs to be stored the responsibility of the village to provide secure storage and leave it at that. Um, and then we'll leave the details of the workings how that to. And I agree with that. Um, one of the things we were grappling with, not just on that subject, but across the board is what should be code versus what should be process. Right. How something is done has nothing to do with the code. Yeah. And you know, I'm, Sometimes we were good about that, and sometimes we weren't. Right. Right. Well, it, it's a problem that I think the ethics board faces, but probably the same as the traffic board and the zoning board yep. and everyone else. And the village should have solved this problem for us. But if it's there's some general blanket um, that, that will, will withstand time, I guess, is my concern. Yeah, that's a good point. And we can, we'll take a look at it and see what we can do to address that. Okay. Um, Yoram, I didn't derail your quick comment. <laughs> I, I thought you were done. No, I was. Uh, the, the, the other comments I have are ones that I can just email around and I'm not at all concerned that you know there's any issues or any further discussion we need. Uh, Sherry, Jeff, Susan, anything else you want to add as well? Nope. I covered everything I had. Can I ask, um, one of the documents that Dan sent out to you guys was something called a RACI matrix. Could you please take a, I'll walk you through that in a sec. Can you please take a look at it and make sure I have the ethics board responsible, accountable or whatever in the appropriate places? Excuse me about that. I couldn't download yep. it. Um, there was a technical reason that I couldn't download it because it's in Excel and it, it won't go onto my iPad and I my lap, my desktop is broken. So do you need me to send you something back? I can't see it. Okay, I'll see if I, I'm also um, not always technically proficient. I'll see if I could save this as a PDF. Yeah, that would, that would work. Okay. Ellen, is that something we can talk about at our meeting that we'll have next week and then get back to you with that timing wise work for you? Sure. I, you know, to me, this isn't specifically code related, mm -hmm. but I kind of lifted stuff from the code. W one of my knee jerk reactions when I first read the existing code was there was a whole lot of stuff and no ownership for anything <laughs> or, or for very little. And where there was ownership, it was with you guys and nothing on the village. 
Um, so that's kind of what I was trying to address. And this, you now have up the process maps. My um, end career, uh, the last few years, I was implementing many regulatory projects for investment banking. And it, it, I just got so focused on, you could implement what you want, but if you don't know who's supposed to do something, the feds are still gonna come after you. So I was trying to call out where in the critical places, what a high level process should be, even though this isn't a process document and the RACI matrix, who's responsible, who's accountable. What does RACI stand for? Responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. Which are the four columns on the document you couldn't see. Yes. <laughs> and if I can't do it as a PDF, Susan, can you see um, Word documents okay? In... Yes. All right, I'll try it. If I can't do it as a PDF, I'll try to do it as a table in Word. Okay, I'm sorry. N no problem. The new computers are not available because of all of the, you know. Yeah, the 9 million container ships sitting That's in exactly. California. Exactly, <laughs> my computer died two weeks ago and I got to wait for another three weeks, I think, before I get the Ugh. one with all the stuff on it. Okay. Uh, to the ad hoc committee members, thank you for you know taking the time to give us this chance to express some of our thoughts to you. And like I said, we'll have some small comments. And if in our next meeting we think of anything else we overlooked, we'll reach out to you and let you know. But it really was nice to be heard. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, input is very, very much appreciated. And um, uh, comments, your comments were, were great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Sh Sherry, Jeff, Susan, Alan, do you guys have any other business you want to go into before we adjourn? Yep. Nope. All right. All right. I said the little red hand. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, do we have a motion to adjourn then? I move we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks you. Again. Thank you, everybody.